Hello everyone, I am the Lore Explorer, and this video will contain spoilers for Outer Wilds. And in today's loop, we're going to talk about the timeline of the inhabitants of the Stranger, or as the community calls them, the Alks. While playing through the DLC, we experience the story of the inhabitants through environmental clues or short video clips that we find called reels. And this is able to pass a surprising amount of information onto the player, but it was almost impossible for me to go through and piece out exactly when the important things happen and in what order. So in today's video, we will set the record straight with answers coming straight from an interview I did with the developers of the game. And just as I asked them, their timeline begins when the inhabitants finally reach the eye of the universe. But their true timeline does start before this, and I'm going to try to fill in the gaps left by the developers as well. So to start, we zoom in on what seemed to be a pretty peaceful moon orbiting its ringed home planet. It's hard to say what kind of society the inhabitants had when we are first introduced to them. They seem to be a relatively simple civilization that's very serene and peaceful. But sadly, this would be the last quiet and peaceful night this species will ever have on their beloved home moon. As everyone is likely relaxing late at night, the telescope scouring the sky receives a peculiar signal, and after checking out their advanced telescope, the inhabitant using it receives a vision from this signal. This vision was coming from the special signal put out by the eye of the universe, and it must have been extraordinary to witness, because whatever that vision was, they immediately called everyone they could find to come and see what they experienced for themselves. And while all we see is just an artist's depiction of the symbol of the eye, the way the inhabitants act, putting their arms up as if reaching out for the object emitting this signal, like they were yearning for it. It seems the entire civilization was immediately fixated, and maybe even already begun to worship that object that emitted this signal, which was the eye of the universe. And this may have been something connected to their original beliefs or religion, but even if it wasn't at this point, from that moment on, the whole civilization dedicates all of their efforts into making an interstellar ship capable of making it to the eye. And it wasn't only their effort that they dedicated to this, they even sacrificed their beloved home moon. They didn't even leave their homes intact, as these two were cannibalized for their timber, allowing them to construct more, or maybe even identical homes, on their ship. And I'm guessing, one of the first buildings used from that wood was probably to create the two temples dedicated to the eye of the universe that we find on the stranger. They essentially move their entire moon's ecosystem right on into their brand new gigantic spaceship, atmosphere and all. They sacrificed everything they knew and loved for the chance of making it to the eye, this newfound object of worship. And with the eye in mind, they gave little more than a wave goodbye and a glance to the moon they adored for so long, and they took off on an incredibly long interstellar journey with a large amount of unknown risk. Sadly, it's basically impossible to say exactly how long it took them to reach our solar system which the eye resides in, and exactly what they may have experienced during that long journey. We see that by the time they reach their spot around the sun, one of their spaceship ports have gone unoccupied, a ship like just disappeared. Did they lose it in some unknown adventure on their long journey to the eye, or did something else happen? But even in the Outer Wilds universe where scale was a bit strange, it's safe to say it was certainly a long ordeal. But after their long odyssey through space, the inhabitants finally made it to the object that they have been worshipping for quite some time now the eye of the universe. But when they arrive, the inhabitants aren't quite sure what to expect, and so they go and retrieve one of their light staffs capable of scanning the eye. But once they do, they immediately fall to their knees in despair. After all they've done, after all they've went through, the eye showed them nothing to rejoice over. After coming to the eye hoping to find something worthy of their worship, they get shown the heat death of the universe was inevitable, and there was nothing anyone could do to stop that. Along with this, the eye showed them the mechanics that would happen if someone were to enter the eye, but the inhabitants really weren't interested in that part. They were more worried about the heat death and how that would affect them. Horrified beyond all belief by this vision and what it means, the first thing the inhabitants do in response is destroy the temples dedicated to the eye on the stranger. They burn down the eye church and topple the eye symbol in the eye temple. 
to the inhabitants who literally fear losing information as much as they fear death, what they just learned is unacceptable. If the heat death of the universe kills the inhabitants, not only would they all die, their story and collective knowledge will die along with them. And this wasn't their only issue. The inhabitants didn't want anyone else in the universe to hear the signal that was being emitted from the eye. They wanted to keep it a secret from the entire universe. If someone visiting the eye, like they saw in the vision, is at all related to the explosion they saw in the vision, they wanted to prevent someone from ever reaching it at all costs. And so, after they destroyed the eye temples on the stranger, the inhabitants turned their efforts elsewhere. They began construction of what we know as the eye signal jammer, and despite the easy construction we see in the reels, I assure you it wasn't as easy as they depict. The inhabitants had to put a lot of time and effort into preventing anyone else from finding the eye. And after constructing something large and powerful enough to entirely cover the eye's signal release, the inhabitants deployed the eye signal jammer and turned it on to do its job. And just like that, the universe was silent again. But after a long journey and a massive disappointment, the inhabitants were sort of at a loss. They really didn't know what to do. Luckily for them, their next move was sort of spelled out for them. They had to go to the inner part of the solar system to be able to utilize the sun for its energy. And right after they parked, they invented the cloaking field for the stranger and deployed it so they can no longer be picked up or seen from most of space. They effectively made themselves invisible. And after finally getting a bit of peaceful and quiet time to reflect, the inhabitants look out over the new solar system they're in. And it seems this simply reminds them of what they've done as a species, what they sacrificed and destroyed just to get here. So they sit down as a group and just watch a reel of their homeworld over and over, and you can tell they're genuinely grieving for this. So now, they're basically just trapped in a foreign place that they don't care about, stuck just watching reels of their own homeworld. But they realize there isn't much they can do about the past in their home moon anyway. So after they make the cloak for the stranger, they begin working on the one idea that they can think of that'll allow them to live past the inevitable heat death of the universe. And so they began work on the simulation project, and shortly after that, they began the work on the artifact technology as well. But after reflecting on this point, I don't really think the inhabitants simply did all of this because they were scared of the eye and wanted to hide from reality, or anything like that. I think they're actually acting quite rationally at this point, if my logic holds up anyway. After all was said and done, yes, the eye did disappoint them and they sort of forsaken their beliefs, but it did tell them one thing. The heat death of the universe is coming, and there is probably nothing they can do to stop that from happening. So instead of them running away from reality or hiding or anything like that, here's what I think's happening with the Alx in the simulation. After coming to terms with everything that's happened, after getting all of their anger and frustration out on the eye temples by destroying them, they realized something needed to be done. And so they utilized their amazing light and vision technology to try to conceive of a way to live a normal life beyond the point in time where all suns died out. This way, not only will they survive, they'd be able to preserve their story and history digitally. And they were able to conceive of a way to make it happen. All they'd have to do is utilize their light technology to make the simulation. But even if I'm wrong on that front, of the rationality of it all, after the cloaking field was deployed, that's definitely when the inhabitants began work on the simulation. Which started with them using their staffs to scan their memories and digitally recreate their homeworld. They may have converted towers on the stranger, but I think they may have constructed these towers fresh. And each tower comes with its own antler antenna and a special green fireplace connected to the wires underneath, in which the green dream fires are lit. And of course, there's more to this, like how they made the test chambers before this and the Cinder Isles Tower being where the entire simulation is networked together. But the main thing here, timeline-wise, is they made the simulation and the towers to go along with it and all that. And once the artifacts were complete, their simulation were ready for use. There were still some issues to iron out here and there, but they weren't really all that important, and most importantly, it worked overall. The simulation was set. They even set up features for the future, like an autopilot system, so the stranger itself would fly away when our sun begins to go red giant and start to explode. 
and after planning a ton of the future out, all of the inhabitants were ready to enter the sim. And we're able to watch this for ourselves. They all gather up together and entered the Dreamfire rooms and all chose a bed. They all went to sleep and boom, they were all inside the simulation simultaneously. At this point, it seems the inhabitants were mostly happy in their sim. This was the right choice. Everybody agreed. And I think they did so for quite some time. I'd say everything went to plan for around two years or so. I mean, that's just a random guess based off of nothing, but I'd say it was a short while. Until one day, a certain inhabitant is shown something within the simulation. At some point, the prisoner was shown how to enter the secret symbol room in the Cinder Isles Tower, in which the codes for the eye jammers controls were stored. The developers don't explain how they received this information, like if they were spying to gain access or if they were just given access, but it can be inferred that shortly after learning how to gain access to this room, the prisoner did just that. With the codes in hand, at some point, the prisoner finally wakes up from the simulation and decides to shut down the eye's signal jammer. But sadly, in doing so, the rest of the inhabitants notice and wake up from the simulation and catch the prisoner. The signal is released for a few short moments, but they were captured almost immediately and they get imprisoned in the vault. The traps under the surface of the sim and everything connected to that were constructed for the prisoner. And the codes to release the prisoner were stored in the same Cinder Isles Tower symbol room they got the codes from. And, of course, the other inhabitants immediately reactivate the eye signal jammer, and in fact, seemingly destroyed its controls to ensure something like this would never happen again. And I think it's at this point that they burn down the prisoner's home in the digital world, as well as scratching out their portrait in the real world. It's clear they harbored some sort of resentment towards the prisoner, but after they had the prisoner locked up, the inhabitants came together in the real world and had a meeting in the abandoned temple's basement. They started coming up with plans to create a real burning room and to create a forbidden archives in the simulation. And to achieve this goal, they came up with the scanning devices able to scan the real world reels and convert them to the digital world. They even planned to hide these newly digital reels from their own species in the forbidden archives, like even other inhabitants aren't allowed in to view them. And as soon as that meeting adjourned, those plans were set into motion. Once the real scanners were complete and operable, they collected all the real world reels throughout the entire stranger and brought them into these separate real scanning buildings. They digitized these reels and ensured that they were safe and sound within the simulation. And after that, they proceeded to promptly burn them. They were kind enough to leave a few slides here and there and maybe even a few mostly intact reels, but for the most part, they destroyed their entire collective knowledge as a species. Even going so far as to burn the prisoners' codes for their vault and transform them into a digital version as well. And they did this not only to hide the information about the eye of the universe, but also to forget things that they simply didn't want to remember that they did. And now that they have all of these reels within the digital archives, they are able to set up measures so no one is able to activate these archives to access that knowledge, not even the other inhabitants. They set up traps and hidden pathways not only to hide the prisoners' codes to release them, but to simply prevent anyone from reaching the forbidden archives as well. So all of these measures that we set up with the burning of the reels, the lights having to be turned off to enter the certain part of the archives, which alerts the other inhabitants to go on patrol, or even the traps which lock us in place when we try to get the prisoners' codes, they're all designed to keep other inhabitants away from the hidden information. After the prisoner rebelled, the other inhabitants got so paranoid that they just had to leave these traps and miscues around to try to prevent anyone from being able to access those archives. They were even counting on the other inhabitants of the simulation to just forget this over time. And eventually, the majority of them would forget that there's even such a thing as the real world, let alone these reels sitting around in the basement. But to the inhabitants, this was actually the best solution. See, they fear losing information just as bad as dying themselves. And even though this information is hidden, it's not lost. So they were able to keep this very important information, but also hide it which makes the next part of their timeline all the much more impactful. 
Even though they put so much effort and care into preserving their species' information and story so they don't lose any information, the developer says that years after the archives are constructed, the vaults and forbidden archives which house the prisoners' codes were actually stormed and they destroyed those codes. So after the codes sat there in the digital world for years, something happened that prompted the other inhabitants to go and destroy those codes, and I really wish I could figure out what that was. My sort of kind of guess is maybe that they forgot more and more about the real world, and all they thought was, oh, we have a prisoner here, why do we have codes to release them? So that's my only thought, I don't know, but that's definitely what happened. But regardless for the reasons for these actions, this is simply an unprecedented action the Alks had ever taken. They've never destroyed information, but they felt the prisoner was worth keeping locked up enough to just destroy the codes entirely. And after they do, this is basically the end of their timeline historically. I mean, they decided it was for the best if they were to just sit quietly in a simulation separated from regular history in the world, pretending that it is indeed the real world itself. What more could really happen to or for them? I'd have to wager that some people tried their hand at making their way to the Forbidden Archives one or two times. We do find one inhabitant watching a reel when we find all the reel holders in that place are emptied in the upper part of the simulation. So maybe they snuck down and found one of these reels themselves and brought it up to view it, maybe to keep it as a keepsake. And maybe that's why they're so jumpy and turned off the recording as soon as we shine a flashlight on it. Because maybe they thought they'd been caught by other Alks, and maybe now they thought they'd be, you know, in trouble for having visited the Forbidden Archives. But I suppose technically there is one last thing the Alks did before everything ended. They died. You know, they were still living for a long time while inside the simulation, but they neglected their bodies so much that after a while they ended up dying. And that kind of is where the Alks history ends. You know, anything that happens in The Sim is all coded to happen over and over. Nothing new can really happen. I'd have to wager that over the 280,000 years plus that they've been within this simulation, the only new thing that ever happened is us showing up. At which point, whatever Alks sees us are definitely super surprised that it's not another inhabitant carrying an artifact trying to make it to the Forbidden Archives, but rather a tiny little hatchling rascal carrying an artifact. And in my opinion, this does explain why the inhabitants act so rudely towards us. When they go to patrol to stop someone from entering the Forbidden Archives, they think it's another inhabitant trying to do so. And that's what they're trying to stop. So when they actually run into us, we're the last person they want to see the information they're trying to hide get into the hands of. They don't even want their buddies to see it, other inhabitants. Why would they let us? Of course they're gonna snap our tiny little necks and get us the heck out of there. It's not out of hatred, it's not out of fear, it's out of preventing anyone from getting into those forbidden archives. But sadly for the inhabitants, this really isn't the last part of their timeline. The devs didn't have to tell us about this because, you know, we see it. But there definitely is a bit more. Ignoring the timeline where we mess up the inhabitants, we see the inhabitants' plan go into effect beautifully, then crumble into pieces, literally. As I mentioned, the inhabitants set up an autopilot for the stranger. So when the sun went supernova, the stranger would notice this and begin moving away. And as the sun begins growing to a red giant, the stranger does just that. After living peacefully in the sim for 280,000 years, the inhabitants are about to get a shock. After hundreds of thousands of years of neglect and a sudden bit of extra pressure due to the acceleration, the dam the Alks built literally crumbles, washing away a couple of the towers that the dream fires were inside. Both the River Lowlands Tower and the Cinder Isles Tower are left in ruin. And with the tower fires extinguished, the inhabitants that were occupying that part of the sim are just simply no longer. They've been forced out of the sim and deloaded into their dead bodies, which kills them. The hidden reservoir, luckily, was above the level of water that reached it, and its fire stayed safe, and as well as the prisoner since it's inside of a diving bell and pressurized. But this means that just before the inhabitants and the strangers were about to fly away and survive for as long as possible on the power that it has, 
two-thirds of them just simply died and were deloaded from the sim. Only one small group of inhabitants remained being simulated by the end of the game, and of course the prisoner. But I suppose that's more than most species at the end of the universe, so I'd seem sort of like a win. And a certain ending where we take the Ash Twins warp core and head to the stranger, we do learn that the, we survive there for quite a while after it leaves the solar system, even though the universe has come to an end. So their plan actually did make sense and was successful, and it, well, would have been even more successful if two thirds of them didn't die, but the plan itself was thought out well. Their simulation will probably still run until the stranger eventually runs out of power. And of course, their information in those sims don't die with the fires. We can still find their story within the digital walls of the stranger. So in a way, they did achieve their goal in not letting their story die. They outlived us and their story continued on, even well into the next universe in a way. And again, if we take the warp core and then enter the sim by dying, we get shown that we do live a very long time after this event. We live for so long, we can't even remember whether or not the reality that we came from is true or what, where we're living right now is the reality. So it has to be a very long time that the inhabitants survived after the heat death of the universe. But I suppose if your last piece of history is also the universe's last piece of history, well then, you did a pretty good job. In fact, now the universe ending isn't the last piece of history in the universe. The last piece of history in the universe is the Alks flying around in a stranger. So that's pretty damn impressive when you actually think about it. And I think that that's a pretty good story to tell. A species that just came from humble beginnings on a moon that was very serene and all they did was look at the stars and ride rafts and fish all the way to surviving past the end of the universe. Pretty impressive. And that's about all I have for you today. If you learned something new in the video, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel. And as always, thank you to the members here on the channel. As usual, this is a lore explorer diving deep into the game so you don't have to. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.